Hello, I'm Jesse Mollop, and I'm a proud Indigenous man from the Larrakee Nation of the Northern Territory. On behalf of the Imperfects, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which they record this podcast. We pay our respects to the Elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge their spiritual connection to family. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are recognised for telling and sharing stories with one another, and the Imperfects draw inspiration from the oldest living culture in the world as they share stories of their own. We're all imperfect, and on this podcast, I'll be chatting with a variety of interesting people who are willing to make themselves vulnerable by sharing their own struggles and imperfections. Then, we'll discuss the invaluable takeaways we can all apply to our own imperfect lives. I'm Hugh Van Kylenberg from The Resilience Project. And I'm Ryan Shelton from My Mum. And I'm Josh from Hugh's Mum. And this is The Imperfects. Well, here we are. So, so, so exciting to be back. I have missed, I might be coming in a little bit hot here, but I love you guys and I've missed doing this with you so much. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I could say the same thing. <laughs> well, it's been a whole week. Uh, some of you may have heard the introduction episode, our like fake trailer type episode. Yeah. Not fake, but you know, no It guest. was real. It was absolutely. It was the, it actually they're happened. They're real. <laughs> um, and so, but now we're here for the official episode one. And wow, this feels, it's, it's like last week was the pre-season cup or whatever yeah. they call it. it. used to be called the Ansett Cup. I it mean, did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In footy. But uh, now it's like actually round one and we're here to play. It, it's, and it's very good to be here. We, and sports analogies will not stop. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never listened before, that is not what this show's about. <laughs> yeah. The first of three quarters starts now. <laughs> Uh, well, they probably just listened to our acknowledgement of country as well. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that was, I, I just to give the background of that, I guess, that, that was uh, a young man known Jesse Motlop. Uh, I've just started working with Carlton Footy Club this season and I met Jesse not too long ago and it was Josh's idea that, well, I think we all thought we should, we haven't had an acknowledgement of country before and which is just ridiculous. And so we, we, we decided to go, we, we're having one this year and and Josh, I think you were saying. Oh, just that. Felt a bit ridiculous or a, way, a, a missed opportunity for three white guys, one of us, to do it. So we thought, why not get someone who is indigenous to um, to do that? And it was Jesse was awesome. Yeah, mm. and, and so the and so the your idea, Josh. Yeah, I feel like you're not taking credit for this. You no. should be taking absolute credit for this because <laughs> it's great. And if it was a pun, I would be trying to take credit for it. But it's not, <laughs> so I'm happy to pass the credit to you. Um, <laughs> so no, the idea being that um, throughout the year we'll. Um, find a few different people who have indigenous podcasts, yeah, uh, as, yeah um, uh, or indigenous uh, people who have podcasts of their own. And Jesse does have one called Hugh Deadly Discussions, Deadly Discussions, yeah. which, which is on YouTube. Did, did, so did I link the fact that he plays for Carlton, or did I just? Yeah, yeah. okay, good. So. Uh, I don't know if you said he played. <laughs> Maybe I just said two different facts. Yeah, you yeah. said. Jesse Guess what? Up. I'm working for Carlton, and then there's another guy called Jesse. Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> relation. He plays for Carlton. He's just been drafted to Carlton. 18 years old. Love a lovely kid in. Yeah. And he came in here to do the to uh, uh, yeah, to do the reading, and we and we said, why don't we try and write it together? It'd be a nice thing to do. And it ended up being Josh and I trying to make it. We just we were really struggling to get the wording right. And he said, do you want to just give it to me? And he he just yeah. did it beautifully. So yeah, and that was it. beautiful what he wrote. And uh, yeah, and we'll be changing it throughout the year. So yes, you'll be hearing from different people, and we'll point you in the direction of their podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Now we, there's so much to cover here, and we and we want to try and keep these intros relatively short and so so sweet, as sweet as possible. It seems to be the most polarizing part of the podcast. Is like really passionate people are going, "I want more from this." Yeah. My favorite part of the intro, and then other people yeah. are going, "Stop yeah. talking." Ah, oh, there are people who are like eye rolling about the the intros, and then there are people who are eye rolling so much that their eyeballs are doing full spins, like full 360 <laughs> spins in the In head. appreciation for how good it is. No, yeah. just in like, get on with it. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> like roll, like oh, yeah, eye yeah, roll, yeah. but yeah. it's going like, vroom, yeah. and coming all the way back around. <laughs> like when, you know, like when those rides at the at, um The pirate parks, ship. The, the pirate ship. Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually it gets so high, it's like, whoa, all the way around. Anyway, it's a the long way of explaining. all the way around. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure they do. But anyway, people's eyes are doing that. Some people's <laughs> eyes are doing it. <laughs> what a strange start to the episode. Um... So yeah, so we do have a place you can contact us. Oh my now. god, this is huge! Mm. Huge in a way that we've talked about this for so long and we've debated about it for so long because we think social media 
is, is pretty disgusting. Well, it 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 can be, it can be problematic yeah. for some people. Certainly is for me. Yeah. I find it. Oh, I, I, I I get it. Absolutely addicted to it. But like, as we talked about last week on the introduction, the trailer app, we were conflicted about whether to have our own Instagram. Anyway, we have one, and we chose a name, and it's pretty cryptic. Um, it doesn't really make much sense. It's at the Imperfect Podcast. <laughs> That's taken us about three months. It has. It really has. <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. But that's what we landed on. We'll be putting the things we'll be putting on there are like just clips that we think are, are helpful or interesting to you guys to put them on there and then um Yeah, like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely do not feel the need to do anything. Just watch them, enjoy them, and yeah, that's all we hope. And I'm trying to do natural segues to the next topic here. So there's a guy doing that for us. His name is George. And oh, we mentioned yeah, George. George, yep. and George is terrific. Yep. We, we have a team this year yep. and we want to mention them because they are just, first and foremost, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And I yep. cannot believe, I cannot believe we've managed to I know. to land them. Yep. Land them? Uh, that sounds yeah. good. Bring, bring them in? Bring, yeah. yeah. I can't believe we managed Welcome to Welcome them. Yeah. Well, uh-huh. anyway, I can't believe we've got them because they're just terrific. And they're yep. unbelievable at what they do. So our producer, Bridget, um, he's, well, we mentioned it. Everybody said last in the intro, everyone needs a Bridget, and they do. Yep. Yep. Um, we have uh, Andy doing all the video stuff uh, yep. alongside Josh. Uh, he's British, and we have a we. One was not enough for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was like I mean, I remember the day I walked in. I said, "Guys, one British Andy is not enough," and I was very, <laughs> I was upset. I said, but "There is no way I'm working on a podcast that has one British Andy." <laughs> and so, luckily, I knew another British Andy. Called him, and he with the has appropriate joined. skill set. Yeah, that can edit. So he'll yeah. be helping edit the ep- or he will be editing most of the episodes. British Andy number two. Well, there are two British Andys, equal value. <laughs> we, <laughs> we also have a jam now as well. We have a Jamison. We have a Jamison, yeah, um, who just so happens to be my girlfriend. <laughs> no big deal. Um, um, but you brought on your brother. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like it was fair enough that I could, uh, it's my turn to bring on someone that was very close to me. <laughs> uh, but no, Jamison will be editing as well. So, yeah, uh, we've, we've got a, an amazing, amazing team. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah. So, Kate Langbrook. Many people know Kate Langbrook. You've, you've probably seen her on many things on television, whether it be the, the project or have you been paying attention or even the panel back in, back in like, this is like 20 years ago was the panel. And that, that's where I got to, that's where I first saw Kate Did Langbrook. you watch Neighbours though? I did. Well, she wrote on Neighbours. She wrote so on Neighbours. Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't watching Neighbours going like, God, that writing feels very much like Kate Langbrook, who I don't <laughs> know a, about That's yet. a Langbrook for sure. Yeah. No, but yeah. So I, I, I guess I was introduced to her work on Neighbours, <laughs> but didn't know her by her face and herself until she's on the panel. I got to know her personally a little bit when I worked at Nova about 11 years ago, whenever it was. And from the first moment, I mean, I always really loved Kate from as a fan of hers, like watching her on TV, listening to her on radio, just thought she was incredible at what she did. And then when I met her, it, it, it's always nerve wracking meeting people that you admire. And she, in the, from the moment I met her, she was so welcoming. Hmm. In, like she'd been at Nova since Nova started and she was so welcoming to me and to, to Monty and, and Whippa. We were doing the show back then. And and ever since then, I, I've just felt like she's so supportive um, and she's there's just something about her. Mm. And you know it, you now, now that you've both met her, she's just, a, she's just a special, she's one of those special people. Agreed. Mm. Totally agree. And, and it's kind of hard to to explain except for the fact that there is a there's there's a caring um nature to her uh almost a a maternal thing even mm. though she's not that much older than me I don't think but there is there's this sort of maternal caring thing that she shows I think everyone that she comes into contact with and anyone that knows her I reckon would say the same and I just I don't spend enough time with her I don't I don't know her she's not a close close friend but every time I do catch up with her, it feels like she is my close friend. Mm. She's just a beautiful person, and I'm just so happy that she wanted to come on our podcast. It just, yeah, it it mean it means a lot to me because I think of how I I look to her. It's almost like an, a a 
a validation of sorts, mm. I think. Well, she's very fond of you, that's for sure. Just chatting to her about you, so that was... Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was lovely. What would you, put... you say exactly, though? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> just like exact words. What was the tone, timing? Just replay it. <laughs> no, um, but no, well, that's that's nice to hear. But, she's, yeah. yeah, after a life-changing trip, and we talk about it a little bit, but she, she upped her life, her family life, four teenage kids, and decided with her husband, we're going to go and live in Italy for a year. And then that blew out to two years. Yeah. Um, and so she's written a book about that called Ciao Bella. But it's also about the, at times, heartbreaking um, life circumstances that led her family to make that decision. Mm. And this is incredibly raw. She was talking, she actually, well, here's something she said about you. We were talking about the Imperfects podcast with her and she said the episode you did with Ryan, she said it had the effect on me that when you're in a, she said it was so... So this is the episode in season one. Yeah, that yeah. you did where yeah. you spoke about your career and, yeah. and, and friendship. And yeah. and she said, as he started talking, I was thinking, oh my gosh, he's really going there. And it, she said, everything around me just disappeared. It was like the oxygen got stuck, sucked out of me and I was so intensely glued to it. Mm. I, I, and I felt that exact thing when we were chatting to Kate. I was so, I was, and I was looking at Josh at a couple of occasions where we were just so in it and so mm. immersed in every word she had to say. So uh, I really hope you enjoy this one. There's some really hard bits to listen to, but it's punctuated with her incredible comic timing. And it was just comic relief when we needed it throughout. <laughs> yeah. Um, which obviously she's become, it's why she's so successful as well. So there's so much heart, but also such a funny person. So, yeah, she's, I, as, she is as, I mean, not just in this, but just in life, she is as real as it gets. Yeah. I'd say like she does, she doesn't really stand for bullshit. No. But in a great way, like yeah. it's like authentic or bust for, with yeah. her. Yeah. I remember a couple of times I, was, I looked at Josh and I was just thinking to myself because we used to watch the panel all mm. the time, and she was, as I say, when her and Glenn Robbins are on there, you're in for a good time. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. And I, I just had a couple of moments of we're sitting around a table with Kate Lang. Yeah, like yeah. it was a very strange. How, how lucky are we? That's yeah. what I sort of yeah. incredible. So it would have been a great show called The Table. What? Oh, <laughs> just the three of you sitting around the table. <laughs> anyway. Seems like the good high point to get into the interview. <laughs> uh, yeah, really hope you enjoy this one, Kat Langbrook. Kat Langbrook, thank you so much for joining us on the on, uh, on the imperfect. I'm so thrilled. I'm perfectly qualified because I am imperfect. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, I'm so excited to be chatting to you today, and the reason is I, I sort of. I was thinking about this the last few days. You've been very present in my life, full stop. I mean, we we I love Neighbours. There was a couple of years where I loved watching Neighbours and it was oh. and, and you're a writer on Neighbours. Yes, yeah. and then yes. In nineteen ninety eight, I reckon the panel started about ninety eight. Yeah, one yeah, ninety yeah, ninety eight. Yeah, maybe. because I, that was my final year of school and, and that was my one show that I chose to watch. Yeah, right. The, the kids week. the kids liked the panel. Oh, oh. I loved it. It was on Wednesday nights. Yeah. So for when people you and, who don't know. Yeah, Wednesday nights. It was an hour mm. and when you and Glenn Robbins were on, I knew I was in oh, for a yes, good time. Yes, <laughs> yes, I knew yes, it was gonna be yes, a good hour. So yes. there was that. And then I leave school and I started working at a gym. And it was, I had to be there at 5.45 in the morning, did it for a couple oh. of years. And I, look, if it wasn't your first show, it was definitely in the first week of you and Husey on Nova. On Nova. And I, I, I still swear to this day, it was the first show you ever it did may when well I got there. Because the guy said to me at the gym, there's a new radio station and they only play cool music. Yeah. I was like, we should definitely have that on. Yeah. And then we put it on, it was you and Husey. And it was just, so I sort of, I, I feel like I listened to every show for the first oh. two years and I was so involved in what you – I just loved it so much. <laughs> you know, it was a, a funny thing that happened in Melbourne because when Nova started, it was the first time there'd been a new FM radio licence granted in, you know, yeah. like mm. a thousand years yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and they'd, <clears throat> they'd done it in Sydney the year before. They'd started the year before and then they came to me and Husey and Dave O'Neill and asked yeah. us to do breakfast here. And in our first survey, we went number one in – which is like unheard of yeah, in, yeah. because there were so many things that you were doing that were new. You had to teach people a call sign 100.3. It hadn't existed before and yeah. a new show and we'd come from Triple R um, and so we were not commercial at all. But it was a testament to the way Melburnians are. 
Mm. Like that, they just went like you, like there's a new radio station. Oh, let's have a listen to it. Mm. Mm. Like on it, on it. Yeah, quite amazing. Yeah. Well, it was so, it was it was great, and I, so I just feel like just thinking about you. I thought, gosh, you've been so present in my oh, life. Yes. So I'm so excited that we're chatting to you today. I really oh. am. I, I feel. Well, um, you probably have probably got nothing for you. You don't know. You'd be like, <laughs> heard it. <laughs> yep, seen it. Yep, done. Nah, yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 well I'm halfway through your book. Oh, Ciao, yes, Bella, and yes, I, yes. I, I love it. I, I realised as I was reading it, I, I don't know if you're the same at primary school, but I learnt Italian for for seven years and I cannot remember a word. No. My <laughs> kids <laughs> my kids went to primary school that taught Italian and one year the Italian was taught by Emma from Geelong, who we love. She was one of our kids' prep teachers. She literally, I think, had Google Translate in one hand. <laughs> and uh, Buongiorno. Uh, like, we love you, Miss Emma, but no. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway. Anyway, no Italian spoken in our family yes. okay. until we – Peter and I started classes before we went – so we went in 2019, we moved in January and we probably started classes maybe in July and we were supposed to go once a week. I probably did about eight classes. Yeah. Peter, yeah. of course, is very steady and reliable and has a commitment to a diary that I don't have. So if he's made an arrangement, then it is set in stone. So he would go to – he went to more classes than me. Yeah, Okay. Okay. And I've hardly spoken any Italian at all since we came back. Really? Which was the start I guess you don't have a reason year. to, do you? No, but it's kind of like the other day I couldn't remember the word for chicken, which is ridiculous, polo, and I could not remember the word for it in the kitchen. I was so upset. I, I feel, feel like it's wearing of, off. That's, that's yeah, a, yeah, I feel like the, Symbolic. Yeah, the, the language is part of the magic, mm. both when you can speak it and when you can't speak it. Mm. You know. Well, I do want to talk about your trip to Italy. I, I think for me the themes I kind of wanted to talk about today was family. I mean, this is – and I'm just going through your book, which which I'm loving, and I've been quite emotional. Josh mm. and I cry a lot, I've yeah. realised. We both cry a lot. Yeah. I know, and I find it odd that you do a, something called the Resilience Project. <laughs> <laughs> no. Physician, heal thyself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you might want to take some of your own advice. I mean, you know, I don't know. So I want to talk about family uh, and the journey uh, and the journey your family has been on. And I, and I guess I'm talking about your eldest son, Lewis's Leukemia. Yeah. Mm, I'd love mm. to sort of hear more about that. Yes, and, um, yes. But also I want to talk about friendship. And I think as you say in the book, I, I think today's chat will be about love, I think. Yes. I mean, that's kind of what the book is about. It is. It is really. And your heart is on the page, as you said to me yesterday. Yeah, Very right. Much so. Yes. Very much so. Yes. Which is what makes it so beautiful to read. I kind of, because I didn't know how to write a book, and so I just started writing stories that, uh, recounting stories that had happened to us, that the ones I remembered. Like people are like, oh, the, your memory is so incredible. I'm like, it's not. I only wrote the stories I remembered. Yeah. I only yeah. wrote the food yeah. I remembered. I only yeah. wrote the encounters I remembered. Yeah. But um, it was, it is the story of falling in love mm. with the country mm. and with my family again and with my husband and well, can we with talk about myself. Your can we talk yeah, about talk your family? You can to, talk about whatever you like. So you've got four kids. Four, yeah. I've got Yanni. Artie, Sunday, and Lewis. Can I? Re I just want to read because I love this paragraph so much about parenting. If that's all right from your book, please. Let, I mean, it's really relevant or topical to me right now. I, I really wanted. I this interview means a lot to me. I really wanted to go well today, and so I was saying to my wife, "I have a good sleep. I'm going to exercise in the morning." <laughs> and our daughter woke up at twelve. Our two-year-old daughter woke up at twelve thirty last night, uh, and I couldn't get her back down until four forty. Uh, <laughs> and so I was like, "I had about three hours sleep. There's no way I could exercise on three yeah, hours sleep." No. Nah. And so, but I was reading this again this morning, and I just thought, "My gosh, it's so perfect." So I was going to read this out just for the listeners, because I just I love your description of things throughout the book, and I particularly love this. Imagine, if you will, that everything you hitherto loved and enjoyed has been stripped from you and replaced by a life of dawn to dusk and dusk to dawn servitude in which your tiny, irrational masses not only relentlessly demand things that can only be delivered to, uh, by you, but they're also prone to bedwetting, tantrums, squabbling, endless questions and food fights. 
It might be less galling if your overlords could actually speak or read or wipe their own bottoms or were taller than two feet high. But though you are convinced you know more, you know nothing when it comes to them, only that you are there to serve. And here is the irony. You do so willingly, warily, but willingly. Because this much I have learned, nothing enslaves you more effectively than love. Mm. So good. Mm. I mean, that's my mm. experience. Yeah. Yes. That's my experience. It's know, clever, Joshua. isn't it? Yeah. It's clever what, um, what the way humans are, that it makes us do things to look after people where every aspect of you would bridle at it yeah. if it was not for love. Yeah. It's addictive, the kids. Mm, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It I, is. I was so angry at Elsie last yes, night. I was so angry yeah. at her. And then this morning yeah. I was trying to still be angry for some yeah. reason. It's not her fault. She's too, no, but I was that's just, right. Just going, you yeah. really ruined me this morning. Yeah. And on a day I don't want to be ruined. Like yeah. you could have done it on the weekend. No. Where's this come from? And then she just like, she's just learning to speak too. And she and she said, um, when I was leaving, I was not giving her much. <laughs> and she said, daddy, work car, love you. And, and I just went, oh, my gosh, like, mm. what, what am I doing? Mm. Why am I angry at you? No, I know. And that's part of the, oh, you know, it's like I started doing yoga. <sighs> I mean, it's brilliant. Sounds great. <laughs> no, it's actually brilliant. <laughs> it's just I'm so terrible at it. And people go, and you can't be terrible at yoga. It's a practice. It's well, anyway, I'm terrible at it. Yeah. <laughs> but there's so many lessons, life lessons in it, like the – the discomfort is where the benefit is yeah. and parenting is very similar. Mm. Like the the whole point of you today is that you didn't get what you wanted mm. and that you didn't get what you planned and yet you still have to do today. Mm. And that's where the growth is for you. There's no growth for you if you're like, oh, I got eight hours sleep and I've been, what exercise would you have done? I've, we've got a bit of a – I've set up a gym down in the garage and I'm very proud of you it know. I'm very excited by it. There's no growth in that. There's like probably just pleasure yeah. when that is beautiful. Yeah. But the growth is in that you're doing today, Yeah. not at all how you imagined it. Well, and no that's one, because of children. Yeah. I mean, no one would know that better than you. I can't imagine how hard it was for you doing your job, breakfast radio. For I mean, it'd be hard enough – for anyone who's a parent, four kids, my gosh, like I'm struggling yes. with two, but four kids. But then in 2000, was it 2009? Everything's turned 2009, on. 2009, yeah. Everything's turned on yeah. its head for you. Yeah. And you could, so are yeah. you happy to talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lewis? Well, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I, I, I always like to kind of preface it. Well, not always. I don't talk about it that often, really, but how lucky I am to be able to talk about it. We talk about him now that he's 18 and mm-hmm. he's six foot two. Mm. You know, and because and <laughs> apparently, um, because I'm very aware of the parents who we were at the children's cancer on in the children's cancer ward with who can't have this conversation yeah. about their children. So I'm always just very. Um, we had a good outcome, you know. We're not done. It's not done, you know. We, there's a cloud over him, but I think we know what the cloud is. Everyone's got a cloud over them. Most of us just don't see the cloud. Mm. We know what his cloud is. Mm. Um, but so in 2009, Yanni was uh, five months old. He was born in July. We had four children under six. And Lewis um, was at prep, in prep, and he'd been sick for a couple of weeks. But just off, and he went to a family party with all his cousins. And my mother-in-law said, "I, I don't like it. He's he couldn't even play with the other kids. He just had to lie down. We were, had to carry him onto the couch." And I said, "Well, I've been to the doctor twice, and they gave me antibiotics. This, this doctor I'd been going to the whole time I'd been in Melbourne." And um, Marie said, "I'm going to take him," and I said, "Oh, that'd be good." So she took him and she had a fight with the doctor and the doctor said, because she was going to give us more antibiotics, and the doctor said, if you don't like what I'm saying, you can take him to the children's hospital. And Marie said, I will. And that night we were in the children's cancer centre and he had leukaemia. And um, it was... How did you find out then? So your mother-in-law 
to yes, call yes, you. Yes, 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 yes. Peter went with her to the hospital. Did you have any feeling that it could be something really bad? Or? No, but no. Marie said as soon as they saw the doctor's face in emergency, she said his face was terrible. Oh, God. She knew. She knew. She said when she saw his face. So were you called into the hospital? Or was yeah, it- we were at the – I went into the hospital. We were all in the hospital that night. And the first night – I mean, it's so surreal, obviously. But we, the first night, they like they make such beautiful provisions for families as much as they can in at the hospital that there was, and this was at the old children's hospital in Melbourne, there was a room for parents whose children had just been diagnosed so you could actually sleep there. It just had like a double bed in it. And um, Annie Peacock from Crown had donated like toiletries in there. And, like, so there were Crown slippers and Crown bathrobes in there. And not that you probably slept much, but you were just so exhausted. So you could be near your child. And Peter and I were like, oh, this is so good. And like on the third day, they said to us, you know what, you can't keep staying here. <laughs> we were like, oh, of course we can't. But we were just like. Getting your mail redirected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were just, you know, it's hard to know what to do because when your child is sick, you're with your child. And then we had to, but of course we had three other children and it had happened in the time of year when I was on holidays and the kids were on holidays. Well, the kid's life was a holiday. They were little kids, but, um, so we had this like six weeks to embark on the start of his treatment and to kind of get it, to kind of get a sense of, how things were going to progress so that when it came time to go back to work, which the hospital was really insistent about, they were like, you must live a normal life. They said that all the time to us. And we mm. we were like, how can anything ever be normal again? Mm. Like to, just so – anyway, so I went back to work and then Peter and I and Peter went back to work. We were We were kind of on the basis that – and we've been like that ever since, really. I mean, we were probably like that when we started having children, that we were always like, let's try and do this. Let's go here for the weekend. Let's go to the snow. Let's whatever. If it doesn't work, we'll come back. So that's how we were with cancer. Let's try and see what we can do. Let's try and go back to work. Let's. My daughter had to start school, even because we've been having that debate about um, whether she should start, she was only she was the day two days before the cut off, mm. so she was the youngest mm. by ages. And because because people keep their kids back as well, some kids were like over a year older mm. than her, so she had to start school, which was not great for her in retrospect. Mm. But we were just like this whole family's got to get the show on the road. Mm. Like we've got four years of cancer treatment in front of us, so. Um, and the first year was terrible, like just terrible. And everything that we'd been told didn't happen. Not not really anyone's fault, but they were like, oh, children tolerate chemotherapy much better than adults. And Lewis was just constantly sick and vomiting. And then it turned out he had an infection and, oh, it was just, and he went blind in one eye and they thought he'd relapsed. And I write about that in the book and it was. Yeah, I've actually, I actually. Mm, can I actually read that? Yeah, you read can. That because I just, yeah, you can. That bit there just – so there's a couple of – I just took screen grabs of two parts because I just oh, – yes. the parts that really moved me. But this one here, I, I tried to take each fear-filled leaden step evenly. Each stroke of his little bald head with my hand was calm and reassuring. Every word I spoke, I uttered quietly and lightly to make sure I would not betray to my child the quivering fear inside me. I made little jokes and his father and I smoothed his pyjamas – and we lifted his tiny body onto his, hus- on, onto his hospital bed. And everything was white and bright and clean and surgical, except for his fluffy blanket we had brought from home. And I smiled and murmured and comforted my boy. And the kindly surgeon said to me very gently, I'll take good care of him, I promise. And I could only whisper, thank you. And I had to turn away because inside I was fluttering and weak like a captured, wild, dying thing. Mm. How is it hearing mm. your own words? Like, I mean, oh, that's I mean just... that that description of it. I I imagine like any parent who reads this will automatically put themselves in your mm. shoes. And my first thing is, I don't know how I could cope. People said that to us a lot, really. 
but you just do, don't you? Because who else is going to cope for you? Who else is going to cope for your child if you don't cope? You just have to. I mean, I guess there are people who can't and don't, and but I think if you live long enough, life is just going to kick you somewhere where it's really going to hurt. <laughs> mm. And the fact that it hurts is because you don't know where the kick's going to come from. Mm. And if you love people, that is where the worst pain is going to come from because loving someone is where you take all the risks. And that is that was our, our test of life, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Is there a point that you look back on in that four years where you remember thinking it can't get worse than this? Was there a point where you just felt like you're at absolute rock bottom at all? Or is it or is the whole does it feel like the whole thing with that whole four years was just like that? The the first I I'm gonna say eighteen months just felt like we were just on a an inclinator that was just taking us on a descent into worse, 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 worse. Mm. And the worst thing, the worst moment was really when Lewis went blind in his eye. And once again, he was at Marie's, who was at my mother-in-law's house in Sunshine, because he couldn't come home because he, his immunity had been blanked from his lumbar punctures that he would have. Um, and we had three unimmunised babies at home, the greatest risk to his immunity. Mm. And... Um, so he had to stay, he would often stay with Marie and Marie's a former school teacher and so she had a, her little, the sanatorium, we'd call it the back room that Peter had had when he lived at home and she had all his school lessons up there and yeah. anyway, and then we were, I was going over and we would go over and see him every day and we were going over there one day and Marie said, he's gone blind in his eye, he can't see out of his eye or whatever she said, I thought she meant I didn't realise that she meant he was blind and he couldn't see. And I knew as soon as I heard that, I'm just like, so then I said, I'll meet you in at the hospital. So instead of going to Sunshine, we met in at the hospital. And then they, obviously they all thought it was a relapse because the leukaemia he had lived in the, lives in the lining around the brain, obviously the optic nerves the spine and in boys in the testes. That's why the treatment's longer than it is for girls. And um, they all thought he'd relapsed. Well, they didn't tell us that immediately, but you can tell you get pretty good yeah. at reading that, mm. the nonverbal cues at the children's hospital, you know. So he, we, they had to find a surgeon who'd do a biopsy on his eye and that it was hard to find someone because he was a child because he was so little. And then there was a surgeon who was coming down from Sydney who did it, who was that beautiful surgeon. Mm. And then we had to wait while we got the biopsy results and that was just the most terrible time. I remember he was at the um, having the operation at the Eye and Ear Hospital in East Melbourne. Or, mm. Yes. And there's that big beautiful church there. Is it St. Patrick's? Yes, it is. Cathedral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were sent out of the hospital while Lewis was having the operation. So when he went under, they went, you can come back in an hour or whatever. And so we were we we're just like, where do we go? What do we do? And we tried to go into the church. I said to Peter, let's go into the church and light a candle. <laughs> we, we couldn't even work out how to get into the church. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> such an imposing kind of, you know, it was pr – that's probably a metaphor for churches, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that we couldn't work out how to get in there. It was just terrible. It was so terrible. Mm. And then we got the biopsy results on the Saturday morning. We were at home together and there was a French doctor, Dr. Francoise. Anyway, Dr. Francoise had sent the biopsy result off to uh, – unbeknownst to our – oncologist to another hospital rather than where they'd normally go. So they couldn't find the biopsy results in the system, but it was because they were at this other hospital. And she called us on the Saturday morning. And because we were talking about transplant at this point and we took the kids in to get tissue type to see if they were compatible and none of them were. And 
Peter was like, why did we have so many? <laughs> what was the point? <laughs> anyway, they, w- they were just so convinced he'd relapsed. And then we got the phone call from Dr. Francoise on the Saturday morning. And I took the phone, I went out onto the front porch because I'm like, I can't have the kids see me get this phone call because this will just be, you know. And it was her and she said, there is no trace of leukemic activity in the, in the optic fluid. And I said, what? She said, there is no trace of leukemic cells. There are no leukemic cells. And I said, oh, can you say that again? And I got Peter. Peter was inside like standing in the hallway. And I put it on speakerphone and she told us again and we just like clung to each other. And we're like, yay, he's just <laughs> blind. <laughs> you know, like just... just <laughs> it was just amazing. It was amazing. It was a miracle. It was a miracle of the kind that we lived, you know. And then they didn't know what was causing. It was an infection in his eye, of course, which he was very susceptible to because yeah. his he was, was all. yeah, he was eighteen kilos <clears throat> and had a feeding tube, and he was on this terrible regimen of. Lumbar punctures and chemo, and um, he'd had radiation because he wasn't in remission when they thought he would be. Mm. Anyway, so that was that. That's the yeah. That's the the low moment. That was that was yes. Followed by an extremely big high. <laughs> big high, and then of course, even though we'd had that high, that the news wasn't the worst of news that we'd sort of been expecting. Um, we still had to make our ascent from yeah, like. Really, really, really poor health. And I imagine it's a, like now you know it's an ascent that was successful. Yeah. But at the time you don't yes. know that. No, you don't know. No, you don't know. It's yeah. like a, everywhere you put your foot, it's the ground gives way underneath you and you're just mm. kind of sliding back. It's really, I'm so, um, when I hear that people are looking after people who are sick, not just children, I'm I'm like, I know so much about them. Yeah. I know so much about them. I look in their eyes and I see in their eyes like a certain lack of sparkle that my own eyes had. Mm. I, I know it. Mm. I know it really well. Mm. How do you deal with hope in that? Like, do you allow yourself the luxury of hope or do you deny it? How do you? It's not. Or is that the wrong word? No, I would say faith. Okay. I don't think it was as much hope as it was faith. Yeah. And really it was just surrendering to other people's faith. You let other people hold the faith for you and all the people of faith came forward, you know, our babysitter who was Persian and Muslim was, was always saying little prayers, shilling ying, shilling ying, I love you, I love you, you know, and mum and dad's church, they they were still churchy even though they'd left the Jehovah's Witnesses. They did prayers and Jewish friends and Catholic friends and we just took anything that people had for us. Mm, yeah. We just were like, thank you. Yeah. Wasn't that I had faith that we were going to have a good outcome, but I just had to have faith that that whatever happened was going to be survivable, you mm. know, mm. for us. Mm. And it was, and it was. Yeah. You know, I d- I don't know how I can't even embark on that thought of what happens if you have a different outcome. Of course, I yeah. can't even. You know, the, the the shadow of the valley of death that I walked in was enough, mm. you know, let alone that it's not just a shadow, that it actually is death. I'm just like, that. Yeah. that's a, a burden that I can't even begin to imagine how people negotiate that. Mm. We all, I think, I think as a parent and that concept, I just, I don't even go close to thinking about it and so many people don't need to whereas I guess you yeah as you beautifully said you walked through the the valley yeah yeah Yeah. and because we were also in treatment with parents who are having that with their children yeah 
and because there were little ones who fell along the way that we knew that we saw all the time in the ward and, you know, so we had to acknowledge it. We couldn't pretend it wasn't happening. Yeah. Mm. But for us, faith was just such a gift and it was quite a revelation for me that I, because I'd had this religious upbringing and I was always like, because I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, which was the religion I was raised. When I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, I went through a period where I thought I couldn't believe anything mm. because I didn't believe that. Mm. And so that was good to know. <laughs> that was good to know that I don't know how people live without faith. I just don't know how they do. Mm. Yeah, you know, no. whatever their faith is, I mean, atheism is a faith, I, I believe, you yeah. know. It's not necessarily a particular but it just is a a, a sense that you're um, not alone. Mm. Did you? Um, maybe I'm I'm sort of projecting my trying to imagine how I would react, which is impossible to do, I think. But and I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. But was there a sense of like, as you were saying before, Hugh said, "How do you do the the work, or how do you how do you how are you so strong in that?" situation was there a sense of like okay this is the job now this is the task at hand or like what's the mindset that you go into that makes you go the hospital work or the the work of the, being the work of being a, um a rock for your son oh i don't know if it's kind of that if it was that conscious we would all have t- turns where we were weak and you know this was when it was just such a you know um, such a fortunate family that I found myself a part of and that I had created and yeah. that Peter was so brilliant, whose name means rock, <laughs> yeah. you know, Petrov. <laughs> but um, at times when you were weak, someone else was strong. Yeah. But overall, I think it was just, you know, chop wood, carry water. You just keep. Keep yeah. going. Mm, you keep yeah. going. And they told us it was a four-year plan. So I was like, that's such a long time. Yeah. But that's the thing about time. It passes. Mm. So you knew. But there were some days where I was just like, oh, my God, I hope my car crashes on the way to the hospital because I I would just rather not, not be here. Mm. I hope the car crashes with me and Lewis in it because I cannot bear what we're going to face and what we're going to be told and what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, but. but Anything to take it all, yeah, to stop it all. I think so. I think so. But also then I had my work and work is a salvation. Yeah. And there was the, and we also had three other children that we had to look after. And, you know, it was not a question of not being able to go on. No. Yeah, that's not an option. No. Was the. Was the parenting of the other three children as much a relief as it was a yes. not a, a burden was the wrong word, yes. um, a relief? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. As I always think little children are. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of our crimes, like a moral crime that we commit, is the way we put all our old people together in one place without access to little children. Yeah. I'm just like there's just – it's they're just such an antidote to yeah. – you know, order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they just – anyway, so that that was good. But so much so that, that one day um, Yanni had a broken wrist. We had this flight of stairs and he would climb up. The, the bottom of the flight of stairs had like a railing, a, like a balustrade or whatever, and he would jump off it onto the ground. So it was a drop like this, like this table height. And one day he did it and he kind of fell on his wrist. We're like, oh, that would hurt. And But he seemed to be fine for a couple of days. And then Marie was at our place and she picked him up to swing him around and he absolutely screamed in pain. And we went to the children's hospital. This was a great parenting day. I had two children in, in the children's hospital on the same day. One in emergency. Yanni, it turned out he had a broken wrist and he'd had a broken wrist for two days that, of course, we hadn't picked up on that because 
if it wasn't leukemia, it was like broken bones. Yeah, yeah. People would say to us, oh, so and so's got a broken bone. We're like, what? Like you. <laughs> yeah. Like, you. like those things didn't even. And poor Yanamun had a broken wrist for two days that we hadn't picked up on because we weren't watching for that. Yeah. So, you know. They were, it's, but that normalcy was just, oh, so great. Yeah. But also exhausting. Just because yeah. the normal life is exhausting. <laughs> Mate, the, the nor- normalcy coupled with leukemia is exhausting. Yeah, exhausting. Yeah, yeah exhausting. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to chat to you about friendship through all this and also the fact that you were working the whole way through and not sharing, obviously, what you were going through. No. Well, obviously with the people I was working with. Like yeah, everybody yeah. knew. Yes, of course. Yeah, just not the And public. the broad, broader community knew. Like yes. all the comedians knew yeah. and a lot of journalists knew. and Yeah. Everyone kind of just held it, which was amazing, really. Yeah. Well, I, well, I want to ask you about that. I just want to read one more thing that just I, I was so moved by this part here. And I guess I'm, I'm reading it now just because I've been talking about one of your lowest moments in this whole battle. But And also we're talking about fear before, so that's why I want to read this now. It was a terrible day in a terrible, terror-filled time. I was mired in despair and exhaustion. Lewis's body was shrunken but swollen with steroids. He was down to 18 kilos and had a nasal feeding tube. His eye was still blind and was damaged from the surgery. There was to be no good news as we shuffled into the doctor's office, me full of dread, but trying to be calm and push away the stomach-dropping nausea that came with fear, and keep upright and strong for my boy, my love, my firstborn, my prize, my heart song, my frightened and weakened little bald badger. I faltered. I read that. I stupidly read that in a cafe. (laughs) And and it's quite a... It's quite a buzzing oh. cafe as well. It's a twilight that Josh Ryan and I go to a they're, lot. They're like, there's that resilient guy. <laughs> yeah, fucking crying, there weeping is. in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that hit me so hard. I, mm. I um, and again, just reading it, I, I, my heart song. What a beautiful description for your firstborn. Mm. The mm. one you know the best out of yes. all your four kids. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I really love that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that in the book. It was, uh, a, it was a, Well, partly I wrote the book. I mean, people will be listening going, jeez, what's this book? You know, <laughs> it was kind of to explain. <laughs> Why that, is it called Jail Bell? <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. Um, was was to explain, I think, because people always ask why we'd moved to Italy, why yeah. we decided to move the six of us to Italy. And to me, that was kind of why that we'd experienced this with with Lewis. I mean, we didn't move till he was fifteen, and Yanni was nine, I think. But Peter doesn't believe that that's why we did it. Mm. He just believes. You know how I was saying earlier that that simplicity, simplicity is not really the right word. But they, he's most men I know are not guilty of overthinking. I suspect <laughs> you may be an exception. <laughs> I think we both are. Yeah. Like. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but Peter's like, oh, I just thought we wanted to move to Italy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, but well, there is that. <laughs> anyway, so that that was kind of the – and also because I believe that life is um, – and the Italians, I mean, that's why it was just such a perfect experience because Italians are so good with joy and they're so good with sorrow. Mm. That they're so good. They love love and they love to lose love so they can be all sad and bereft. <laughs> and Romeo and Juliet, yes, you know. Yes, of course, yeah. Um, which I know that was Shakespeare. Where was someone going to write, oh, Shakespeare was in Italian. <laughs> but it was in, it was in Bologna. Bologna. Yeah, what, where Verona. You? Verona, right. Yeah, okay, Verona. Verona, yes, very good. Verona, very good. yeah. Someone paid attention. Paid attention to your book. So anyway. Yeah. So they're very – you get the whole package with the Italians. Mm. Like there's not a part of their life that they that they need shove away. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was – it's very joyous and rich. Yeah. Very nourishing. Which is know? what you're after, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't that we didn't have a beautiful life here. We had a great life here, but there is a – Cultural impoverishment in Australia, undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah, totally. And I think it comes from maybe that the white part of Australia is so new. You know, it's a new mm. 
Whereas in Italy, everything is so old. Yeah. Like all parts of Europe, you're struck yes. by it. You just think, hang on a minute, this has been here for a lot, like 600 yes. years longer than yeah, struck, like, correct. Wider, wider, correct. Yeah, correct, correct, yeah. And, of course, I think their relationship with the church, it's no longer what it was, but that yeah. that the family part still is. And, yeah. You know, they're just very generous, amazing, um, alive people. Yeah. Mm. Just so alive. And not, not, um, not pray to what we're pray to here, which is got to get my superannuation up and oh, got to get it, got to buy another investment property and run my name. Like they just, we did not have one conversation in the two years that we lived there about renovation or real estate or except for us. Who was so fucking Australian? We were waiting for our apartment to be renovated. That's how Australian we were. We had to bring a renovation to Italy, you know. Whereas they, they were just like not. It's just not a preoccupation. Yeah. We had so many conversations about what we were going to have for lunch and where we were going to go and had we had this from here and have we, you know, tried the ham from Palmer and have we blah 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 where to go to get the best food and the. If we're in Sicily, we have to have this and we have to go there, and but not about renovation, not about money, not about <laughs> superannuation. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it's a, I, I think, I mean, that's the book is really Ciao Bella is, a, is about your move to Italy, but also the stories behind it, the subtle things that take place throughout your journey mm. that, uh, that lead to this trip. One of the things that, I mean, it's such a huge thing to do for kids, teenage kids to uproot their life. And because we <sighs> yeah. even, we were looking at holidays. For Queensland later in the year, I said to Penny, gosh, we're going to have – well, how hell else you go on the plane? It's three, and, three mm, hours and 20 mm, minutes. Mm. Like we have to pack food for it. I'm thinking this is going to be so <laughs> yeah. bloody. Do we really want to do this? Yeah. You yeah. went You went for a year to Italy yeah. with four teenage yeah. kids. Yeah. And, and it was and, so and good you, we ended up doing it for two years. Well, there yeah. you go. Mm. Yeah. And it was uh, – but then you – I so I want to talk about that, but I just want to talk about your relationship – well, friendship and, and the, I suppose – the the one I want to talk about is is with Dave Hughes. Ah, oh, Hughes. You remember he talks. Oh, you talk about yeah. him very lovingly in your book yeah. as far as yeah. how important he was to you during Lewis's diagnosis yes. and, and 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 that for you because you're working with him and you're there. Yeah. I mean, there must be something about the person you see from five o'clock to nine o'clock every single morning. Oh. You must have this closeness of you, you don't, know you can't everything hide a thing. in yep. in if you're doing breakfast radio, you know everything about each other, <laughs> and like everything. Mm. Their bowel movements. You know everything. Yeah, of course. You know, he doesn't know mine. <laughs> but I know his. I know his. Um, but uh, because there are – it's it's a kind of a thing in radio that, that um, particularly duo, duos end up hating each other. Yeah. Not everyone, obviously, but um, – You hear a lot, though. You do hear, you hear yeah. a lot. The shows more, where they won't than, talk yeah. to each other when yeah. the microphones yes. are off and – yeah. Anyway, we were not one of those shows. And so when I told Husey that I wanted to stop doing our show, which we had done together for 18 years. Wow. Um, with a year off. 18 years. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's incredible. incredible. Yeah, yeah. And with our same producer, Sasha, as well. Gosh. So um, when I told him that I wanted to stop doing the show, it was really – and because he's a workaholic, you know, he's given up everything. He's – Gives up meat. He's given up alcohol. He's given up smoking. Given up pot. Given up porn. He gives up stuff. But so work is really his only vice. He's a okay. proper workaholic. Like he okay. would turn up and do stand up in your living room if you had ten people there for <laughs> no money. He would do it because that he's like that's his you know that's his vice. And I'm not like that. So for him to try and comprehend why I wanted to stop doing our show that was like top rating and great and I loved him and it was nearly impossible for him to understand. And because he kept saying to me, what are you going to do all day? What are you going to do all day? I was just like, well, how do you even answer that? <laughs> like who has trouble filling a day? <laughs> like just it was quite amazing. Yeah. Anyway, and we're still like beautiful friends. And I ended up doing that. He got his way. I did the show for the first six months from there. Did you resent <laughs> him for that? Were you, was there any resent in that? Yeah. It's not, yeah. Yeah. 
Because and that was partly why we decided to stay the extra year. Because, so you could actually get that year. Yeah, because yeah. I'm like of my precious year that I had to work. We had to work so hard to like chisel it out of the stone of commitments. You know, <laughs> um, six months I spent working, so getting up at it changed with daylight saving or whatever. But getting up again at five o'clock in the morning to do um, drive radio back to oh. Australia. And then we had school holidays for three months. Oh. 12 weeks. Wow. School holidays. The Italian schools have 14 weeks <laughs> school holiday in summer. What are you supposed to do? Anyway, I mean, we went to France. We found ways to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we made it work. But anyway, and then he wanted me to come back in October. And I'm like, oh, I will actually not have had any of my year in Italy. And, I mean, we were still in Italy, obviously, but I was tired, you know, and whatever. I just wanted to have nothing. I just wanted to be in Italy. I wanted to be with my family in Italy. Buying having the best ham. Doing yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with nothing. What I wanted, as it turned out, was lockdown. <laughs> 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 I wanted to wake up in the it. morning and go, what have I got on today? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I got it. I got it in spades. <laughs> anyway, so that was hard for him to understand. Can I bring it back to, to Lewis then with his struggles? How has that horrific, horrific four years, how has that helped him? As a per- are there any areas of his personality where you say, well, of course he's like that because he's learnt to fight for four years for something really difficult? Or That's a good question. I mean, I think he's got a very high EQ mm-hmm. because he's spent so much time with grown-ups, four years, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so he's very intuitive and he's just good. He, he likes He likes, you know, older people. I think there's probably a downside to it as well is that that currency for a kid that I had cancer is like, it's just so shocking that I think sometimes people back off Mm, putting the pressure on when they, you know, teachers or whatever. I don't, I don't know, but I suspect. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I suspect. I mean, I've seen some of his essays. (laughs) (laughs) I suspect. <laughs> he's very clever, you know, but he's like me, he's not particularly academic, I don't think. Yes. But then he does have some of Peter's studiousness. So yeah. his alleged father is um, <laughs> very like diligent and, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I think he asks questions now because, of course, it's the memories are a bit vague. Of course. And we don't really talk about it very much at all, of course, because we're, yeah. you know, yeah, because we're then. living. Hmm. Yeah, of course. But there is, I think there will be a time where he probably has to do an accounting of, like on the ledger of his life, like that's a yeah. that's a big chunk, isn't it? Well, maybe that, we haven't seen the positive impact on it. You know, maybe something will happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years where he's really challenged and his first thing is, well, I've, I've got through that. Maybe, maybe. Nothing. But when he got through it as well, we got him through it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he did it, but because he was so young, it was not that he had to do it. Mm. Yeah. Whereas now it's interesting because he's 18 and he was soon, well, they haven't told us yet, but they're going to kick us out of the children's hospital soon. And then he'll have to go to an adult hospital and – when we went for his last checkup, because he's now in the long term effects mm. clinic to see, monitor his thyroid and la la, I said to him, You're going to have to start making your own appointments. That was really weird. Yeah. yeah. Because I don't know that he's, um, that, that, that he understands the gravity of it enough to not muck around with those appointments. Mm. Oh, because yeah. he's the boy who lived. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then he'll have to go to an adult hospital. And I said to him, the things you, you've you seen some stuff at the kids' hospital, but there's going to be stuff you said at the adult hospital that's very different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know, but he's very, he's quite a, he's pretty calm and, yeah, he's good, he's good, he's good. 
and the, and the other kids, the, the, the impact on them, were they too young to really feel it or to, for it to have an impact uh, on them? That it definitely had an impact, I think, especially on Sunday. Mm. Being only, what, a year and a half? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, because I remember one day when I'd come back from the hospital and, you know, we would always tag team me and Peter and Peter's mum and so that there was always someone there. And when I came home, Sunday just started crying because Lewis had been, he was, he'd been in the hospital. It was one of our long stints. He'd been in the hospital for like 28 days or whatever. And, um, Sunday just was like, how's Lewis? I want to shit Lewis. She started crying. Oh. And I said to the kids, and they all shared a room at that stage, Sunday, Artie and Yanni. And I said, put your dressing gowns on. Well, they probably didn't all have dressing gowns, but they had their pyjamas. I said, we're going into the hospital. I'm taking you into the hospital. And so we just went into the hospital. It was night time. It was like past their bedtime. It mm-hmm. was whatever. And we just went in to see. And Lewis was there in a little room on his own because he had an infection. And when she saw Lewis, she just hurled herself on the bed and just couldn't stop crying. <laughs> couldn't stop crying. And she was six. So that is that is in her mm. somewhere, mm. you know. Whereas, of course, the little boys were like, are you going to eat your jelly? <laughs> 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 but that was their way, I think, as well yeah. of, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely in Sunday somewhere. Uh, I feel like humour has been... I feel like maybe I did an interview with you guys. We were actually, we actually on, on your show with Monty, we actually talked about the power of humour and laughter. But I feel like it was a while ago now, but but it is, has that always been a part of coping for you, laughing oh, and being able to laugh? Ha- and- totally. I don't understand people. You know, sometimes you meet people who don't have a sense of humour. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like it's just, well, is it <laughs> yeah, a psychopathic no, thing? No, I just, But you know not, where but- you just don't, I mean, I'm not even talking about if it doesn't mesh with yours, because a humour is such a yeah. kind of personal thing. But sometimes you just meet people who have no humour or you spend time with them and you realise that they don't laugh. Yeah. I, it's, I find that incredible. Like that is just so alien to my family and also to Peter's family and to every friend that I have. Hmm. You know, and it's also a show business thing too, you know, the, like the song, there's no people like show people. They smile when they are low. Mm. It's what show people do. When the Titanic was going down, the band played. Mm. Well, her chicken shits were jumping off left, right and centre <laughs> onto lifeboats. The band were like, no, we're playing. We will yeah. play as the, ba- as the boat goes down. Mm. But they're my people, you mm. know. Not, I'm not born into showbiz, but I'm a showbiz person. Mm. And so you try to always find that. You try to muster that. The spirits have to be high or as high as they can be, even in the lows. Mm. Because otherwise, what are we? What are we? Have we ever seen a wombat laughing? No, animals don't really have a sense of humour. That's the difference between us and them. Yeah. Like that's one of our beauties, one of the great one of the great reasons for the existence of humans is humour. Well, you say well, you said in the book there that you would tell jokes even at the even in your darkest hours. You're still telling jokes. Yeah. To Lewis and- well, they weren't funny, but you know, uh, we tried. You know, you yeah. just tried. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited to finish the book. It's, Make uh, sure you finish the book because I know you'll have another interview coming <laughs> up. Uh, and you'll be like, oh, I don't have time to fit. You finish that <laughs> fucking book. <laughs> well, <I'm>, well, <laughs> <laughs> you, because you can't just dwell on the misery. Got, there needs yeah. to be some joy. Well, I, it's, I, I think that- You're about to enter the COVID year. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yippee. Yeah. No, I, I, it's a great year, actually. Well, I actually bought the- I was halfway through ready. I've actually bought the audio book because I realised- because because yesterday you sent me the voice memo. Oh, yes, And I yes. was listening to it and I and I don't keep voice. I kept it. Because oh. it reminded me of how I felt listening to you on the panel. And I just I love your voice. I love your laugh. And I oh. thought, why am I reading a book? I'm going to listen to the yeah. book. So well, I bought the know, audio book so I can listen to you. I recorded the audio book around the corner from here. Oh, right. Yeah, around the corner from this studio. And um, I 
like I'd never I'd never even heard an audio book before. Yeah. I was like, so a girlfriend played me. She said, you've got to listen to her. So we just went on to Audible or whatever and played some free samples of some actors reading books that I don't hold with that. No, yeah. no that's no. got to be you. Yeah. Someone. I was yeah. asking especially when it's your story. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I recorded it here. It took like a week and so many people have contacted me and listened to the audio book or done what you did, read the P book, the physical book, and then gone to the audio book. But I do, I, I do cry in the audio book because you know how you were reading stuff out to me before these were words the first time that I said them out loud. Right. Wow. Like it's one thing to write them. That's yeah, they become hard more enough, real. But then they? when you have to say them out loud. No, well, that's it's. I've, I've gone the audio book because your voice has been such a constant source of, I think, humour and just um, authentic and wholehearted. I don't know presence in my life. So I want to. It's just nice to to hear you tell the story. So. I thought you might be sick of it by now. No, it's great. It's a great voice. Thank you for having me on. I love these conversations. Wow. I I know I made a big deal before about how much I love Kate Langbrook, but I think after hearing that, um, I just now feel even more... I really like genuinely. I feel like people say this a lot, but I feel genuinely lucky that sh- that I'm in her, not necessarily inner circle, but one of her circles. Mm. Like, like she's just so, like, I just really love the, the woman, <laughs> and I just and I, I and I sometimes like with people like that. I'm, I'm honestly, and this is not trying to be self deprecating intentionally, but I'm like, oh, she's she. It's cool. She wants to hang out with me. Yeah. Yeah, like, totally. You know, not all the time, like, <laughs> but sometimes, <laughs> like sometimes, and that that is, it's truly like I am. It makes me feel very good. Yeah, I got a text message from her last night, and yeah, I same, felt same. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I had I had that feeling of like when you have a crush on someone, and they message you. Mm. As that excited, I was like, oh my god, Kate Langbrook messaged me. Yeah, I mean, I messaged her first, so she was writing back. <laughs> But still, she didn't have to write back, but anyway, she did. Yeah. Uh, well, I love that you've used the word love in there because that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Because I, I feel like in the book she says, she rounds out the introduction by saying, this is a book about love. Mm. And so that was sort of front of mind. But I don't know if you felt this, Josh. I felt very strong emotions yesterday when we were chatting. Yeah. And I think it was like love and as in – not like I'm in love with this person, mm. but it was just this strong. I, I get that sometimes when we're chatting to guests mm. who are just really, we just share something really special and I feel the emotion of love. Not yeah. to say I love them, want to be with them forever, but I feel the emotion of love. I don't want to talk about that today because there's a very strong link between love and 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 living at an optimal, you know, well-being, all that kind of stuff. So I do want to talk about so is that is that like without wanting to steal your thunder? But um, is there? <laughs> I'll take it from here, here. Um, <laughs> but is that is there a connection there? It's like we always talk about, and the reason one of the reasons we do this podcast is the act of being vulnerable connects you with people. Like it speeds up that connection process with someone. It, it does. Is Absolutely. That, is that, is, yeah, it is, is the it love is. So, that you feel like a, an extension. Yeah. So, the, so I'm, this is not my opinion on this stuff. This is from an incredible researcher, Barbara Fredrickson. Oh, yes. Uh, who's just, who, who's amazing. Did she, she write the book Positivity? Is that her? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And she also wrote Love 2.0. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, she's done my favorite ever research. I may have said this in the podcast before. I don't remember, but it's like my favorite research on the topic of resilience. Mm. And she wanted to find out. Essentially, she wanted to work out what is the most common characteristic amongst resilient people. She did this in 2001 in New York, and she's trying to, she's done all these personality profiles on people, right? To, mm. to say, well, let's just get a whole lot of different people and let's find out what their, let's, let's profile them from a personality point of view, from their characters, or from their characteristics. And then we need to create some kind of a challenging task and then see for the people who get through it the best, was, was there something common in their personality? And I think she was struggling through ethic to get stuff through ethics. Like, what what can we test people with? You know, that is oh, mean. Yeah. It's going to be hard to get mm. through, but it isn't unethical. So she'd done the. So she'd got the group, and she it was like, all done. Yeah. So all the research was. So it was all done. All the all the sorry, all the profiling had been yeah, done. Okay. These people. She knew their personality types and mm. their different profiles and the characteristics. Yeah. And then nine eleven happened, and I think her first thought was, "Well, I can't do this now. This is not the time to be researching." You know. Yeah. Emotions. 
So the story goes, and I, I can't remember where I heard this, but she was maybe it was in one of her books or a talk she'd done, but she was on a train and she saw a couple sobbing and it was obviously, it was the day after 9-11 or something. Mm. And she looked back about five minutes later and she saw them sharing a laugh or giggling about something and hugging and she thought, no, this is the time. Like mm, this is, yeah. this is. And what more challenging thing could you ask for? Absolutely. Yeah. And so she went back over the data and she found, she went and all, looked at all the people. And over the next, over the following years, to cut a very long story short, what she found was the most common characteristic amongst people who cope well in challenging times is positive emotion or positivity and positive emotion. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that they bury their heads in the sand and, and you know, didn't engage with the, with, the, with the trauma that was 9-11, but they still found reasons to smile they still and they still found reasons to laugh and they still found – they still involved themselves in activities that would bring them positive emotion and joy. I think mm. one of the examples she gives is a couple who had a book club coming up the next week, I think it was, you know, the week after and they'd lost a loved one and someone went to cancel and they said, no, 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 we need this more than ever right now. You know, they, 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 they still sought out positive emotion and positive connection and that, that's, that's the thing she found. So that's what mm. she's that's, – that's one of her incredible bits of research. But – she went and she wrote a book called Positivity. So you, you, it's fascinating. It is very heavily researched. There's a lot of research and data in there, which it's, so, some- it's sort of like one of it was one of the first books that Maria, uh, psychologist Maria, she recommended that book to me. It's one of the first ones because yeah. it, it, it seems like one of the like bibles of yeah. positive psychology. Yeah, at least. it's yeah. it is a it's a it's a tough read in in the way that if you're not someone who loves data numbers and the research behind it, it can be a little bit hard to get through from that point of view, but she's a great storyteller as well. So mm. anyway, but and I, I mean, I, I've, I've told you that story to talk about just to introduce Barbara Frederick's again, but I actually now thinking about it, I feel like that might've been a very big part of Kate's journey. It seems like mm. she's still, I mean, she said in that episode, she's still the, you know, the hospital said you need, you need to live a normal life. Now she said that's impossible what we're going through, but it sounds like she didn't disengage from how, horrifically traumatic what she was going through was, but she seems like someone who would still, she still told jokes. Mm. You know, and in her book mm. she talks about how important humour was. So positive emotion, so very powerful. Yeah. She, um, I mean, Kate is is a, from from what I know of her, um, is that she lives, she she is alive. Mm. Like mm. she she does things. A perfect example of, is years ago she went to, I think it was Italy, somewhere in Europe, and she bought a life-size marble statue of King Neptune and shipped it back to <laughs> Melbourne and it now sits in her garden. Really? Yep. <laughs> and then she had a huge party to welcome King, ne- King Neptune. <laughs> like that is Kate. Like, you know, that's someone who is living and it's like, just do it. Just, you know. There's a perfect example. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually feel like I didn't plan to speak about that that research, but I feel like it's a, and people might be thinking, okay, well, how do we just create positive emotion? Look up the Resilience Project. They've got really good strategies, <laughs> really good. But but that's kind of, it was so, I spell that? It, <laughs> but to be honest, Barbara Fredrickson's research was so inspirational, so influential to me in setting up the Resilience Project. And that when mm-hmm. people look at GEM, gratitude, empathy, mindfulness, and some people might go, oh, it's a bit airy fairy. I, I, what it does is we're trying to help people create and cultivate positive emotion. Mm-hmm. That's what gratitude does. It, it helps you. It is a positive emotion in itself. Yep. Empathy builds oxytocin, which is which sorry releases oxytocin, which which will lead to positive emotion. Mindfulness helps you to be there, so you can appreciate the good moments as they happen. So it is. Her work was so influential for for the resilience project. So there's your strategies. Yeah. But I guess what I really wanted to talk about today was love and and what love actually is and why love is so good for us and mm-hmm. why it makes us more resilient both emotionally and, and also physically. So I, I think the definition and the understanding of love has sort of been dominated by, you know, artists, whether it's popular musicians or poets going back many, many years talking about what love is. If I was to ask you guys and just give you, say I'll give you five se- or ten seconds to just say what love is, like a definition of love, and anyone listening can do this, put yourself under the pump as well and think in ten seconds can I come up with what's the definition for love, like, like what, is, what does love mean? Could I throw it to you guys to try and give me an answer? Uh, oh, yeah. The okay. first thing that comes into my head is the song. L-O-V-E, love? No. I want to know what love is. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, music covers love. Oh, I thought you were going to say, um, what is love? <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, a, a there's quite a few that ask the yeah. question. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, from, I guess there's so many different, and I guess maybe that's what you're asking, is like what's the universal 
explanation of it. I think it's um, is it is it something? I mean, all I, I keep thinking of like, it's like unconditional love to me is is like the ultimate love, and that doesn't have to be romantic, but it's like it, it's sort of like it's it's a non it's there's no judgment. It's loving a person. If it's loving a person. It's loving a person for who they are, not what they do mm-hmm. um, or what they've done. And it's like it's it's seeing the person for who they are beneath whatever it may be, beneath the anxiety, beneath the mistake, the the infidelity, the whatever it may be. It's st- uh, it's love is the the very core emotion that you feel for a person, no matter what the circumstances and environment. Put on top of it, yep, or distract you. Yep, I don't know. If that's yep. my Josh is definition. Do such a better job. <laughs> is it to me? It's a um, it's a connection that no yeah, one else on, in the he's world. On, he's on. He's on. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Okay, go on. Um, it's a connection that no one else in the world understands, except the person or people in it. All right, I'll get my coat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah. I, but I think yeah. you both. Yeah. It kind of helped make the point that I think so often we think it's about a way you feel about a person a lot of the time. I mean, you spoke about a connection there. I, I, I'm not sure you're talking about just with people, but I think a lot yeah. of us think about a relationship. Or mm. I mean, the, the, he, so I, I looked up most famous quotes on love, mm. and it's just full of, um, you know, whoever's saying it, it, it's about like a long-term sort of commitment to mm. a person. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you my example. So. Um, I've never known how to pronounce her surname. I should have looked it up before here. But Jody, she's a novelist, American novelist. Jody Picoult is that? Oh uh, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it either. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, let's just say Jody Picoult, and if she listens, I apologise if I got it wrong. Um, if, if she listens, like send us an email. We'd love to have you on the podcast. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> one of the most successful novelists of all time. Yeah, she says, "I believe in love. I think it just hits you and pulls the rug out from underneath you, and like a baby, demands your attention every minute of the day." Isn't that what I said? So, Isn't that what I, I thought? I thought word I said for word, that. yeah, <laughs> word yeah. for word, yeah. Well, if it is, it's even more emphasizing my point. That's like a, <laughs> that's like uh, Eric, Eric Fromm, German psychologist, uh, says love isn't something natural. Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and the overcoming of narcissism. It isn't a feeling; it's a practice. Mm, and even back to good. so, but this is all. Th- this is that like the view is very much like it's about loving a person for a long time. That's what love is. E- even. Um, uh, Euripides, the um, ancient Greek playwright, definitely the most Australian pronunciation of that ever. Well, yeah. well, do you know why? Because I wanted, I was hoping, I was wondering if Ryan, had, it, I wrote it so I could pronounce it correctly. It was Euripides. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's what it sounded like. To Euripides. Me. Euripides. Euripides. Yeah, Euripides. So how would you pronounce it? I, I actually don't know, but it just sounded so Australian the way yeah. you said it. Well, it's... when I did the pronunciation thing on Google, and I thought she said Euripides. Yeah. Yeah, I thought she was Euripides. cheering for demons. Could be, yeah. maybe Euripides. shorter. Euripides. Euripides. Maybe. Anyway, so mm. so this is going back. You know, one of the ancient Greek playwrights, but he said um, he is not a lover who does not love forever. And so traditionally, our view of love is kind of this long commitment, and it's to a mm. person. But the science around love says something very, very different. So here, in a nutshell, with all her research, this is what Barbara Fredrickson proposes as a new take on love or what we should be really viewing love as. as This is a healthier view of what love is. Her new take on love is that love blossoms virtually any time two or more people, even strangers, connect over a shared positive emotion, be it mild or strong. And so you don't have to meet one person and then eventually fall in love and be together forever to have love in your life. You don't need to have a family. You don't need to have siblings and and mum and dad and all that traditional family to feel love all the time. Anytime you share a positive emotion with someone you know or someone you don't know, you are experiencing the emotion of love. And the reason that's so important, according to Barbara Fredrickson, is every single time you experience the emotion of love, you are strengthening your vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs from your brain um, to uh, uh, to all the vital organs in the body and into your stomach. Um, and that and the vagus nerve is so important because it, it regulates your body. When you're really stressed, when when something really stressful happens, it's your vagus nerve's job to regulate that stress and get you back to an equilibrium where you were before. And the way we, I mean, and and that is 
being resilient, like that's bouncing back very quickly from a stressful situation. The way we strengthen vagal tone is to experience love. The more love we have in our life, the more likely we are to respond well to challenging situations. Wow. And, which is just, it's amazing research. Yeah. Oh, Love. Th- thanks so much, Rick. I mean, I, I've always been told that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So it's good to kind of get the explanation of what, what actually is going on in Vegas. <laughs> you won't be surprised to learn that Barbara Fredrickson has labored that pun very heavily in all her books. Has and, she really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, damn you, Fredrickson! <laughs> Labored sounds harsh. It's a good pun. I, she just says it a lot, I think. Yeah. Um, but I think it's I think it's just a lovely reminder that we don't you know, I even think about like when I was single from the age twenty eight to thirty five, feeling quite lonely and all my friends are, are married and kids and mm. and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm really missing, you know, love. That's what I need in my life. But I had it. It, there were so many opportunities for love in my life. I yeah. just needed to understand that they were there. Mm, that's so true. It's just yeah. it's just a shared positive. When, whenever you share a positive emotion with someone else, that's that's love. Mm. Or sorry, sorry. Whenever you share a positive moment, well, I was about to say, does it have to be? Does a love of, um, like love of a book or love of art or love of music, love well, yeah. of nature? I mean, if you love does something, that stuff nourish as well. I'm sure it does. But I'm, what I'm thinking about in this example is like, yeah, you know, when you go to the football. And you, there's someone else who barracks for your team and they're yelling out something so, like they're so passionate. Yeah. And it's kind of funny, but you just love them. Yeah, I love yeah. that guy. He's on our team. Yeah. Like you're having a shared, like that's a mm. shared positive connection over yeah. something. You, you sort of feel love in that moment. Yeah. Like it's, it's Also a, because it's my dad. But <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's that level of love as well. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm guessing, Josh, I'm not a music festival type person, but when you have those moments as strangers at music festivals, yeah. when it's just like a song that you clearly, that song just means so much to you and you see someone else enjoy yeah. it just as much as you do, you don't know them, but that's the emotion of love. It's a, sh- it's a shared, yeah. it's a micro moment of positive resonance with someone else. Yeah, I remember I'm thinking of a specific time when I saw the Strokes in 2012 and I was right at the front. And I, I, this guy, me and this guy, I'd never seen him before or again. And we like sung like almost half a song, like right into each Whoa. other's faces. And it was like, it was amazing. I've no idea who that guy is or where he is, but oh it was God. such a, it was, it made me so happy yeah. to find, yeah. Well, you fell was, in love. Yeah. That's amazing. But Sorry, I mean, and, but, but to go back to your question before, we don't have, it doesn't have to be with someone else. Like you can have a micro moment of positive resonance. Mm. by yourself micro moment of positive resonance is where something resonates with you so strongly you feel it in your gut mm. <laughs> you know that, that's yeah. the that that's the vagus nerve that's the like vagus the, nerve, yeah yeah and, and that, that might be um a sunset in the morning you might have got up yeah. early gone for work and you see the that's sun that's an interesting i mean thing to happen <laughs> sorry <laughs> a the sunset sun- in the morning <laughs> <You> go- <laughs> that is remarkable <laughs> sorry you see the sun rise you've gone for a work walk early in the morning it's hard to get out of bed you get out of bed and you see the sunrise and there are birds chirping and you just think, oh, I love this. Like, like, like that, mm. that's love. Mm. Not necessarily waking up next to someone else every morning for the rest of your life. You know, that's, that's the traditional view. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a micro. Whenever something resonates with you so strongly, you almost kind of feel it in your gut. You are actually feeling it in your gut. Mm. I love um, that. I so love anyway, that. That's the, I, I can't help but to, just to think about Barbara Fredrickson, love, positive emotion when listening to Kate. Because I felt so much love during this interview we did with her. I just had so many, I had so many moments of micro moments of positive resonance. Yeah. Um, I'd love to have a micro moment of positive resonance with Barbara Fredericks. And if she came on the show, <laughs> like that would be, that's surely that's closing the circle. In some, like it'd be amazing. The ultimate experience of, yeah, that, having, having that with the person who invented it. For my 50th birthday, guys. I don't want much, <laughs> but if you can get me a micro moment of positive resonance for Barbara Fredrickson, it's all I want. <laughs> well, we got you Darren Lucas for your 40th. Uh, yeah. The next obvious step is the micro moment with Babs. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing a Melbourne Magic singlet. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what a remix. Uh, it's so wonderful to be back with you both doing this. It really is. Yeah. It really is. Love and you, thanks to Kate. Love, love you both. Love, love you, you guys and everyone. Love you, Kate. Hugh, it's Ryan. Oh, how good is it to be back? You, me, Josh in the studio. I just, I had the best time. And Kate Langbrook, how, how great is Kate? She's just, and to do an episode on love as our first episode back, I was, it just felt right. It felt good. And I just wanted to give you a call and let you know that I, I love you. 
I love Josh. I love the show. I love our new team. I just, I'm loving it at the moment. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's that's the reason I wanted to call you. That's the that's the sole purpose. So uh, anyway, I'll. Uh, oh, actually, no, since I've got you on the phone, I um, remember we went out for lunch the other day, and we uh, and you didn't have any coins for the parking meter, and you asked me to borrow like a little bit of money to, to pay, and then you said you'd like pay me back asap. Um, yeah, just haven't haven't received that yet, and uh, you didn't mention it today, so I just yeah just sort of give you a little gentle reminder. <laughs> uh, two dollars sixty-five, I think it was from memory, um, or thereabouts. Uh, but two sixty-five would be would be awesome, actually. Um, whenever suits. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, it's Ryan, by the way, from from the podcast. So uh, yeah, great day though. Love you, mate. <laughs> two sixty-five. To call back. If this episode has been triggering for you, we strongly recommend Lifeline on 131114. The Imperfects is hosted and co-produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Brian Shelton and Josh Van Kylenberg. This episode was produced by Bridget Northeast, edited by Andy Hall, filmed by Andy Poole and social mediated by George Martin. A special thanks to Dr. M for her expertise and guidance. We'd also like to thank the Resilience Project for their ongoing support and, of course, a big thank you to No Mono for allowing us to use their track, Keep On, as the theme to this episode. Our acknowledgement of country was delivered today by Jesse Motlock and you can find Jesse's podcast, Deadly Discussions, on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.